Hola, I'm Cisco Morris and I'm here in beautiful Prince George, British Columbia. And as you can see, a beautiful city surrounded by the forest. Today we're going to talk about the health of the forest. You know, many of us think that the forest is remote, but all I have to do is look at beautiful Prince George to realize that the forest is all around us. It's even in our cities. Now the health of the forest is really the foundation for preventing wildfires. So the more that you learn about forest health, the better you'll be able to protect your home, your family, and your community. Now I'm here with Karen Ripley, forest entomologist. And you know, Karen, as I look around, I'm seeing, you know, some red trees. They don't look very healthy to me. <laughs> Is something killing some of the trees in this forest? Yes, in fact, those are mature lodgepole pine trees that were killed by the mountain pine beetle. The mountain pine beetle is a bark beetle that feeds on the inner bark, the phloem, of mature lodgepole pine trees. When lodgepole pine trees get old, they are attacked by the bark beetles, the trees die, and that creates the conditions for major wildfire to occur. Much of the landscape is dominated by very uniform, older lodgepole pine that has become susceptible in our recent drought years. Those mountain pine beetle populations have really expanded and have, have been very successful at killing trees for many, many miles. Are the same things that help protect the, the health of the forest, are they the same sort of things that can protect the health of the plant in their own backyard? Absolutely, it's the same relationship between the insect and the tree, no matter where it occurs on the landscape. What about the health of the forest? Are there things we can be doing that'll make it more healthy? In a forest environment, we tend to focus on the operation of thinning, removing some of the trees so the healthy trees that remain have enough water and light and nutrients to, to defend themselves vigorously. Thinning and removing the less healthy trees in the forest as well as around your home, not only reduces the risk of wildfires, it also helps keep the healthy trees strong and more able to repel attacks from insect predators like the bark beetles. Rick Arthur of the Alberta Forestry Department works with communities, recreational areas, and national forests on maintaining a healthy, fire-resistant forest. Rick, can you tell me some of the history of this amazing site? Well, we're right at the very west end of the, the Canmore Nordic Centre Provincial Park, right next to Banff National Park. And it's in the Bull Corridor, and the Bull River flows through here, and, and historically, it used to be an area that had a tremendous amount of fire. The valley bottom burned off constantly, and every, every 7 to 15 years is what, what we're finding from our research. And it kept the, the bottom areas open for, as, a, as a natural grassland, and, and that was, was burned, that burning was done through the Aboriginal peoples that used to live and in, in, in inhabit this area. But the bottom line is there was a tremendous amount of fire here uh, many, many years ago, and, and we no longer see all that fire being put on the landscape, so the, the, the forest cover is really getting older. We also used to have natural fire during the really big, severe, hot periods in August where we get lightning storms, and, and they would cause large-scale fire. And the last big fire that came through the Bow Corridor was in the 1880s, and it burned literally from rock to rock all the way down the valley. And, and now what's happened over time is, is all the forest fuels have grown up, and the brush has grown up in those areas that used to be grassland, and, and, and now it's a heavy, heavy forested area. We're looking at the values in this area, the, the Canmore uh, Nordic Centre as an example is, is a multi-million dollar facility. It's an Olympic legacy. It's used by thousands upon thousands of, of visitors every year for, for cross-country skiing, for hiking, uh, for year-round recreation, including mountain biking. So we had to plan it with Banff National Park, with community development, the provincial parks people, and ourselves, uh, and, and create a very natural looking break. We've used uh, natural breaks such as the uh, slide chute and enhanced that and then we've done a whole bunch of thinning further down along the trail systems to, to create that additional width in our, in our break. Now this is a beautiful recreation area, but we're pretty far from the nearest communities. How come you're doing all this work and fire prevention way out here? Well, it just makes sense, Cisco. 
Uh, if you look at, at, at the work homeowners are doing right in behind their properties and, and, and cleaning up their lots, it's, it's really important to, to remove all those fuels right, right, away, right adjacent to the houses so we don't have spot fires. And the work developers are doing with infrastructure and the town planning is also very critical. But what we want to do is, is try to pull way back away from the communities and put some, some primary and secondary guards in place that we can use for fighting fire from well away from the community so that if we do have a threat from fire, we can fight the fire back at those guards rather than right on the doorstep of the community in behind people's houses. So, boy, that's really an interesting idea. So you're actually working making fire breaks and, and uh, thinning the forest pretty far from the community. So you've actually got a fire break in a way way back from the community, you can fight the fire there and help protect the community that way. That's our goal and, and what we really want to do because it's such a high use area is create these breaks so they look very natural and fit into the landscape so that it's not a great big scar. And as an example, we used uh, uh, a natural fe feature here, a landslide chute, uh, an avalanche chute that, that occurs from heavy snowfalls. Uh, it's partially opened. We opened it up a little bit more and it, it blends right in with the natural landscape and now makes a great fire break for us. We'll be right back after I help them do some selective thinning. Are these the pitch tubes where the tree actually tried to spit the beetle out, Karen? That is. You can see there's abundant places on this tree marked with yellow pitch. As the beetle started tunneling into the tree, the tree was trying to push the beetles out with the, the gooey protective substance. But as you can see over here, it didn't, there wasn't enough. The tree ran out of pitch and an ab abundant number of beetles was able to enter this tree. The adults dug their central galleries and laid their eggs and the baby beetles hatched and grew. Oh, the poor tree. Oh, man. <laughs> There's a lot of them in here. There are. There are thousands of beetles that attack this tree. And even the healthiest of trees really can't overcome the number of beetles that are present in this forest. And Really, all, pretty much all of the lodgepole pine trees in this area have been killed. Hey, you found some real beetles in there. There are. There's, usually when the tree crowns have turned red, the beetles have matured and moved on to another tree. Look at the canopy up there, all those red needles up there. Oh, la la. Very highly flammable. And the fine fuels yeah. catch really easily. Man. So Karen, we've got a pretty highly flammable tree here. Absolutely. A dead tree is generally more flammable than a living tree. And the first few years after the trees have died, when they're loaded with red needles, they're really highly flammable. Uh-oh, because look at all this undergrowth here, right under the canopy of this tree. That, and look at that grass. So if the low fire comes in, if it gets up to the canopy, we got a lot bigger problems, huh? That's right. After the needles fall off, some of this fire danger from the tree itself will subside. But in the next few years, as these trees start to tip over and fall down and carry the fire into the canopy of the remaining healthy trees, then you're in for very high fire danger again. And Karen, one thing I've noticed is that there's quite a few conifers here that haven't turned red. And so I imagine that this insect is specific to certain kinds of trees. And I also imagine that must play a key role in forest management. You're right, Cisco. Each of the bark beetles is tuned into one specific conifer tree because they, they can tolerate the chemicals under the bark of that specific tree. And that does play a role in forest management. As we increase the species diversity in the forest, we really reduce the susceptibility because there's very small chances that all the bark beetles will be active on one site at one time. So even if you lose one species of tree, you'll still have the others remaining unharmed. You know, and speaking of management, you know, one thing people aren't aware of is that the understory grows like mad when we get the spring rains. Doesn't look flammable now. 
Yeah, but it only takes a few weeks of warmer summer weather, and this stuff will be really dried out and really flammable. That homeowner better get their hinder right out here and cut this stuff down. Karen, this forest on the Colville Indian Reservation looks so different, so much more open, there's scars of fire on the trees. It's amazing. It is, it's a very different forest, much less crowded, the trees are spaced out, the sunlight can reach the ground, and look at all the profusion of plants that's able to grow. Oh, I love these wild flowers. Look at this potentilla and this lupin, it's absolutely beautiful. Hey. Let's go over and find out why this forest looks so different. Because here we've got Chris McEwen, uh, fire prevention officer. Hi, how you doing? Good, how are you doing? Hey, can you tell me a little bit about the kind of management that you folks are doing here on the Coville Indian Reservation that makes this forest look so different? Well, some of the things we do in an area like this is we'll come in and if you notice there's stumps out here, and we'll uh, selectively harvest some of the trees because too many trees isn't necessarily a good thing because they grow too close together, they get diseased easier, they pick up bark beetle a lot easier. So what we'll do is, like I said, we'll come in and harvest it and then any of the slash or anything that's left on the ground, we'll come in and burn that. And what that allows is it releases some of the nutrients back in the soil, it gets rid of the scattered ground fuels, and also by opening up the forest canopy, it allows the ground forage to grow better for the animals here. Well, you know, the big question I have, Karen, how does that make the forest more healthy? Well, the first thing Chris mentioned was that they removed some of the trees. Ideally, you remove the weakest trees that are present on a site, leaving more water and nutrients available for the healthier trees that will persist over time. That gives them more ability to fight bark beetle, produce pitch with water, also, the physical distance between the trees hinders the way bark beetles could switch their attack from one tree to another. Also, having the open forest really provides a lot of biodiversity opportunities. As the sun hits the forest floor, a variety of plants can grow, providing pollen and nectar and food plants for many types of wildlife. Well, so it really makes sense to me, you know, uh, you keep the forest open, each tree has its own space, it's out in its own sunlight, it gets the water it needs. It's the same thing for the urban garden and for our home gardens. Each tree needs its own space, they got to have the proper water, so get out there, do some fitting, you know, make sure those trees have water. Hey, but the question I got now, Karen, is how do we educate young people so they learn about these techniques and how to fight bark beetle? Oh, kids are naturally interested in everything about insects and forests. I've got some activities I'd be happy to show you. Oh boy, hey, this is gonna be a lot of fun. Hang on, we're gonna come back and show you some really cool bark beetles. We can beat the Tweedle out of the beetles, so don't go away, we'll show you how. Hey, Karen, how's it going? Nice to see you, Cisco. Nice to see you this morning. Oh, la, la, look at all these cool bugs you have. Oh, man, hey, I got a bunch of little larvae with me. They're going to love to learn about the forest and the bugs. Great, bring them in. Hey, larva, come on in here. Wait till you see what we're going to learn about today. Really cool beetles. Oh, la, la. Hey, now this is Karen. She's a famous entomologist and knows all about bugs, and we're gonna learn all about beetles. Well, welcome. I'm glad to see you here today. See, what we've got in front of you are some samples of wood and actually some dead bark beetles. Hey, do you guys think that all beetles are bad things? No. 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 Oh, how come? Because some help. Uh, decompose the fallen wood in forests and make room for new you trees. You know your stuff. And they're part of the food chain, and so other animals can eat them. And... Oh, That's oh right. My. Bark beetles are probably the most important forest insect pest in North America. Although they do have important ecological roles, sometimes they're involved in killing trees and that creates a problem for the people that own and enjoy and even some of the creatures that use those habitats in the forest. Hey, so how do the beetles kill the tree? 
Well, the bark beetles, as you can see, they're very tiny little insects. I have a few in this box, and some, the largest bark beetles are about the same size as a Tic Tac candy, and <sighs> so most of them are quite a lot smaller. Hey, check these out. Are those cool or what? How can something that little kill a whole tree? These beetles work together. As you can see on these samples, there's not just one bark beetle active in a tree at a time. There are dozens, hundreds, even thousands of bark beetles working together to overcome a tree's defenses and take advantage of the nutrients that are present underneath the bark. So is that what's making all those, what are all those little trails in there? Those are the trails of bark beetles. A pair of adult bark beetles digs a main channel and lay eggs along the side. And then as the babies hatch, they mine away from that central tunnel. And so you see little tunnels that come off the main one and they get bigger and bigger as the beetles mature. Anybody know why would that kill the tree? Because it eats all the nutrients up and it, it doesn't let the water go up to the top of the tree. That's right. The bark beetle's main food is phloem. That's the inner bark, right where the bark meets the wood. And that, the job of that tissue is to carry the sugars and nutrients from the leaves of the tree, where they were made by photosynthesis, down to be stored in the roots. And the bark beetle activity interrupts that circulatory layer. The most worrisome bark, types of bark beetles, and there are about a dozen species, are able to actually kill otherwise healthy trees. And they are in a race with the tree. They tunnel in and start to feed on the inner bark. The tree produces pitch, which is sticky and gooey and full of toxic chemicals. If the beetles sever a canal that has resin inside or pitch inside, the pitch pushes forward and goobers up the beetle makes a sticky mess, seals up the hole, pushes the beetle out. Wow. So did, what would make it so a tree can't do that? Well, to manufacture pitch requires a lot of water and energy to, to actually make the pitch. It also requires a lot of water to keep the pitch under pressure. So when the beetle severs that resin duct, it's instantly flooded with pitch and overcome. So if there's not enough water and the trees get drought and they don't get any water year after year, they can't push out the beetle? That is a huge reason that sometimes beetle populations can grow very, very high and cause extensive damage in the forest. We can beat the Tweedle out of the beetle, so don't go away, we'll show you how. So Karen, these are really cool little beetles here. Ah, they're alive! What? what? <laughs> Only kidding. Oh, la, la. <laughs> hey, but what kind of beetles are these guys? They're awful little. These are the mountain pine beetle, Dendroctinus ponderosi. It's an important insect that feeds on the phloem of lodgepole pine, ponderosa pine, and several other pine species in North America. Hey, is this the one that's killing a lot of uh, the lodgepole pines in Canada? Yes, British Columbia is having a terrible outbreak of the mountain pine beetle that's been going on for several years. Oh, la la. Hey, well, I noticed you brought a bunch of cool stuff. Are we going to do some experiments here? <laughs> well, first, yeah. First, I'd like to show just how small these are. And so why does everybody please grab a coin and grab some beetles. Oh, and boy. I'd like to just, just show how many beetles you can balance on the top of a coin. All right, this is a contest. See who can get the most on one of these coins. Mm, they're kind of crunchy. <laughs> Do bark beetles live all around the world? Pretty much anywhere trees can survive, bark beetles will be found there too. And since they're cold-blooded, does the heat affect them? It definitely does. Just about all aspects of their lives are controlled by temperature. The rate at which they mature, the season that they can fly, as well as that affects their host trees and whether they'll be able to successfully overcome its defenses. Holy cats, you can get a lot hard. of these beetles on there. I've heard that to catch beetles, you 
have to manufacture the scent that they give off. The scent that the beetles use to communicate with other beetles is one of the most important tools that scientists use to monitor the beetle activity as well as to confuse the beetles and trap them to protect our trees. Do bark beetles have good eyesight? Bark beetles do have eyes and they do have pretty good vision that they use for part of the time that they locate trees but most of the time they rely more on their sense of smell. Okay, well we've had a contest now. Who can get the most beetles on one of your quarters? Okay, Noah, how many did you get on there? Well, I used a quarter to pile on and I got 77. 77? How many did you get, Zach? I got 62. Oh, la la. Oh, too bad because do you know that beetles are very nutritious? And guess what the grand prize is for winning the contest? You get to eat all the beetles! What do you say to that? Ooh la la! Oh la la! <laughs> Homeowners who take proactive steps to reduce their home's vulnerability have a far greater chance of having their home withstand a wildfire. Take action now, especially if you live near a forest with lots of red beetle-killed or dead trees. Call your local fire department, forestry office, or local landscape professional so you can have a beautiful, fire-resistant yard. For more information, log on to wafirewise.net.